morning, Georgiana. Let's worship together. If you're not up and off your couch and dancing in your living room, you are dead. All right, that's the only thing I can say. Great job, Tori. It's good to have Caleb on the drums with us this morning. Um, yeah, yeah, it's good. This is it's a blessing. We're raising up these young worship leaders. So a uh, couple of things. Can we just talk as a church for a second? I didn't realize, you know, I, you've heard me use the term weary. I didn't realize how weary I was until we had the hurricane preparedness drill that was last weekend. Right, so it was, I went for a walk Saturday morning and my neighbors are putting up shutters and boarding up their house and I got home and I told Diddy, I simply don't care. 
I just, I'm just too tired. I said, we're going to roll the dice and take our chances. And so God bless us that we uh, thankfully did not have a bad event. But I have to tell you, as hurricane season looms in the midst of COVID season and election season and all the seasons I hate, I am weary. So anyway, a couple of things we've got going on in the life of the church. Um, I want to share with you that we are providing back to school faculty lunches at our partner school, Cambridge, but as well at Merritt Island High School and Edgewood High School. Uh, so we're privileged to be able to do this because you are faithful in the tithe and your first fruits. Uh, we're able to bless those teachers as they prepare to go back to uh, in person teaching and learning. And so um, uh, it's a great partnership we have in our community. I want to remind you that this morning or today, really today, is the last chance to sign up for the Children's Ministry Scavenger Hunt. Uh, this is a family event. This is intended to be uh, just a family activity where all of your, you can get the car and do the scavenger hunt. We have been listening to Kelly and Judy talk about it. It has been hilarious. Uh, it is going to be so much fun. So we invite you to be a part of that. Just again, a chance uh, for the church to provide an activity for your family uh, in this season when we're all cooped up. Uh, I want to also share that um, Chris Rodriguez tells me that there are opportunities to pack meals. Uh, we're doing that at the parsonage next door. Uh, if you've been uh, hesitant to do that, part of what I want to share, they're one-hour shifts. We're not asking you to pack 200 meals. We're just asking you to pack, I think, 50 uh, or whatever you can do. But they're one-hour shifts, and uh, the place is cleaned after everybody leaves. You're doing it in family groups. You're not with strangers and different people. So if you have been wanting to serve your church, wanting to serve the hungry kids in our community, uh, and want to do that, please email Chris. She's got uh, openings and uh, would love to have you do that. Uh, I also want to take a moment on behalf of Janice, who oversees the sewing ministry, uh, and just thank the ladies who do the, do the sewing blankets for us. Um, we are giving them out like crazy. Uh, so every newborn baby in our church uh, hopefully receives a baby blanket that's handmade. And then patients that are dealing with terminal diagnoses or post-op patients, uh, we try to get blankets to them. And sometimes when people are just having, going through a period of time where life is hard and they're blue and we just try to allow these prayer blankets to be a blessing. And so we just want to thank the ladies that have been sewing feverishly uh, during our shutdown. They're doing a great job. Uh, so um, all, as we head to prayer, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different. This is typically the time that we would ask the seniors heading off to college, the high school seniors heading off to college, or even just college students to stand and pray for them as they head off to college. And so we want to do this uh, for you this morning. We're going to have a, a little video of some college students, not all of them, but some of our college students in our church uh, to pray over them. And we're going to ask Nathan to do that. But as we go to Nathan to pray, uh, we invite you to be in prayer for two families in our church that have had a loss this past week. So we ask that you be in prayer for the Conti family. Uh, Doug and Lori, Doug lost his dad uh, this past week, and so we ask that you pray for them. And we ask that you be with the Wood family. Pray for the Wood family. Pete lost his mom this past week. So uh, as you've heard me say many times, as I know from personal experience, uh, it's a really, really difficult time to lose a loved one. Uh, never that it's an easy time, but this season seems to be particularly harder. Uh, so Nathan, we invite you to pray a sin, buddy. Lord, um, I lift up uh, the kids. I know they feel like adults, but uh, all the adults know they're still kids. Um, we pray for those going off uh, to college, going off to school for the first time, and even those who are returning to school. I know just um, as our youth pastor, I, I see some faces that are going off for the first time, and I, um, and I think, oh, I didn't have enough time to lay the foundation. Um, there's things I do the summer before they leave that, that helps strengthen that foundation. I know what they're going to be up against. I know what they're going into. And, and a, lot of I, a lot of it, I don't know exactly what they're going into, Lord. And I, and I feel that loss of like, I didn't have the time. I didn't have the time. Will they be as strong? 
And, and I think of all the parents out there who even though they had them for a lot longer are still thinking the same thing. I didn't have the time to lay the foundation I wanted to. Are they ready? Do they know the Lord like I want them to? Will they, will they be strong enough to last? Will they be strong enough to stand? And Lord, when I start to worry like that, I remember that you're going with them, not just to college, but, but through their life. You'll stand beside them and go before them and go behind them and prepare the way. And I just thank you for that. I just pray that the parents and myself, that we could, we could let go and trust and know that you are God and you go before them and you know them, you know their hearts, you know their desires. You knew this day would come, you know the troubles that they'll see, and the troubles they'll face, you know the things they'll fail at. And maybe you see the things that they rise up and become. Not maybe you see, you do know. I just pray that they do rise up and become. I pray that you would give them the courage to become who you called them to be, that they could see your plan as it begins to lay out before them and they could become men and women of God, that they would be stronger than us, that they would be bolder than us, that they would truly be the next generation, that they would be the generation that takes the promised land, that they would just go in and take it. And I just pray that they would always remember that we love them and we're praying for them here, Lord. And we, we, we just know that in your hands, they're safe. And, and actually in your hands is the most exciting place to be. Lord, I pray over our service today. And I pray that, I know there are people out there with all kinds of their own troubles and their own worries. And I pray that we could let go and we could give it to you. Knowing again that you've seen this day you knew the troubles that would come and you see the victory on the other side, the victory that you give us because you're good. And I just pray that your people would trust you, that we would trust you and that we'd actually put up a fight with the college kids and say, no, we're gonna be the generation to take the promised land. You ain't got time because we're going in. You can ride our coattails. I'll tell you what. I just pray that we all rise up, that we be courageous, and that this day we will worship you for who you are, for what you've done, and for what you have yet to do, that we know you're gonna do because we know you're good. We know that you're faithful, and we know that you hold the victory, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My way. Raise a hallelujah. Heaven come to fight for me.
Man, I love that song. Last fall, I was, uh, had the privilege to speak at a conference, and I went, and uh, they played that song. And I remember coming home telling Daisy, this has got to be an anthem in our church. And she told me, already on it. So she had, had been preparing for that. So I love, love the message of that song. So this is the time in our service where we bring our first fruits to God. And we want to be cheerful givers, as Paul advises the church. So I hope with your heart this morning, as you see this as an act of worship, and not as just making a donation to the church. Uh, So with that in mind, won't you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we want to raise a hallelujah. (laughs) And I don't want us to divorce this moment of bringing our first fruits from what it looks like to raise a hallelujah. (laughs) Father, when we give from our hearts, both with time and talent and resources, we are raising a hallelujah in our community because of the trickle and ripple effect of the love from this moment that touches so many. Father, about a month ago, we made an offering to Stephanie and FAI in the Middle East. (laughs) And you know, you knew what she needed. We had no idea what she needed. We didn't know that her car was undrivable and she had no money to get it fixed. And this church standed in the place where she could not stand. And the byproduct was uh, she got her car fixed so that she can do ministry in the Middle East. So, Father, we just give you thanks for the generosity but the faithfulness of your people. So bless what we've given this week. May it be for your work. And may it be for, like Nathan said, the work that only you see that we just need to be faithful to give to. And we pray this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Because of Jesus, my heart
God, within the viewing audience this morning, there are those who've been waiting. So today we pray that you would reveal yourself through the holy word of God, through the singing of our theology, through the praying of our passions. Father, I know in my own heart that I'm not good at waiting. Father, I pray in the waiting that you are at work doing something inside of us and every one of us that we could not do on our own. 
So, Father, we pray uh, for our preacher this morning who's coming, that you would bless him, that you would anoint him. Father, I pray that you would unleash him on our church. And I pray all these things in your son's precious name. Amen, amen. All right, settle into your couch. Uh, Let me just take a moment. Uh, We uh, have invited a preacher to come from our community, Mike Braun, who is an associate pastor at Calvary Chapel here in Melbourne. Uh, He has been a longtime friend. In fact, he and his wife, Bridget, have been friends of Didi's and ours for more than 20 years. Uh, It has been a desire of my heart to have Mike come preach, and this summer has lent itself well for that. So while we're going to step out of our Something in a Name series, you're going to find that Mike's message fits really nicely into what we've been doing all summer. Uh, So um, he is a man that every time I meet with him, uh, the gospel just exudes from him. The love of Jesus Christ exudes from him. And I think you're going to experience that this morning as he comes and teaches us. More than anything else, I have a tremendous respect for his hairstyle, and you'll see that in a moment. Uh, So uh, with nothing else, I don't want to take up any more of his preaching time. Uh, Mike, uh, Reverend Mike Braun, come and bless us with a word today. All right. Well, we love Georgiana, and uh, we're so blessed to be here, my wife Bridget and I, and uh, we just absolutely love this church. We love what God's doing. We love your pastor. We love his wife. Matter of fact, uh, Bridget and Dee Dee taught for many years at, uh, uh, in kindergarten, and actually our 23-year-old was taught by Dee Dee, and he's turned out really great. So um, we're so blessed by him. But we love Georgiana, and there's so many times that we have actually snuck up here to come and experience worship. Wasn't worship amazing today? It was amazing. It was. And we just love, and, and as pastors, we love to get poured into, and we love when we come up here and hear Pastor Corky teaching and just pouring in, and we really get fed, and we just absolutely, absolutely love you, George. And so we want to welcome you online and welcome everybody here. But let's go to the Lord in prayer again. God, we just thank you so much. You are so incredibly amazing, and God, we're so thankful for you, God. We do not do life alone. God, you have filled us with your spirit to walk this life out in the power of your spirit. So God, we just pray that today, God, that your word is alive and active. We know that it is. And God, as we just share, God, I just pray that I am emptied of myself today. Just fill me with your spirit, God. Lord, I just want to be your mouthpiece. So fill me up today, God, with your spirit. God, we love you so much and we praise you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. So... We're going to talk about some things today about interruptions. So the question I have for the church today is, do you enjoy being interrupted? Do you enjoy being interrupted? I personally have a difficult time with being interrupted. Um, I think most of us do. And um, what's so funny is that when people interrupt, and I'm not going to say names here, and it's not Bridget, it's not their kids, okay? We have two boys. But someone in our family, when we visit them on the west coast of Florida, so if you're watching, Dad, I love you, um, sometimes likes to interrupt. So, but I just don't do well with that. And I started to think about uh, we love the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Anybody ever heard of that movie? We watch it every Christmas. It's a tradition in our family to gather around and watch that movie. And last year, it happened to be showing at the movie theater. So I'm like, let's just gather up the family and let's go watch it on the big screen, get some popcorn. And, and you know, the, the tickets were discounted, like, I think it was like $2. Of course, the popcorn and Coke for all of us was like probably like 50 bucks. But we went in and watched the movie and we sat there. And as the movie's going, I noticed there was a guy about 10 rows ahead of us. And he was so loud. He just kept on being so loud and being almost abusive and just interrupting that movie. And I'm like, man, I'm going to go down and have a word with this guy because I want to, I mean, I paid good money for this popcorn watching It's Wonderful Life. And then he gets up and he gets to go to the bathroom and I recognize the guy's like seven feet tall. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm not going down there. Matter of fact, I'm 5'10", I'm just going to sit back down. He goes out, but I did pray that God would interrupt his life, okay? And maybe not come back into the movie theater. So, um, but we do have interruptions. And those of you that are teachers, my wife is a ninth grade high school teacher. And she says that some of the biggest interruptions she gets in ninth grade is uh, cell phones. Uh, between all of the notifications and all the different things that are going on, 
all day long, constantly, she comes home, I had to like take another cell phone away, you know? And it's just a constant thing. And matter of fact, she was telling me about a, an experiment that a teacher did in some school somewhere else where they actually did this experiment in one of his classes. And what they did is they went ahead and they wanted to count every notification, every text, every email, every phone call that a student got on their cell phone during that class. And so what they did is every time one interruption, they would go up and do a mark on the board. By the time of that one class was done, there was 1,000 marks on the board. You figure 28 students, that's about 35 or so interruptions. Imagine that for the entire school day. I think it averaged out to like 245 interruptions per student uh, for the entire day. And I mean, those push notifications are crazy. And I'll tell you what, we got to pray for our teachers, especially about what's going on right now. It's so difficult for them. But man, we need to pray for them and pray for our students. I love how Nathan just prayed for the students and um, we are so blessed by them. And so... And here's the thing is I read a, a study that they did on these notifications. Has anybody ever heard of FOMO? FOMO. Anybody ever heard of that? It's called a uh, fear of missing out. Like I never even heard that word, FOMO, fear of missing out. And what happens is people are missing, they, they get so hooked on it that they miss out on what's happening in the world. And they got to pick up their phone and kind of look at it, see what's going on, missing what's happening, missing what's happening. And it constantly happens all day long. I don't know. For me, it's kind of stressful. I just got to have like my uh, text message, uh, maybe my, uh, my, uh, my email, and maybe just like my phone working. And sometimes even on social media, people will like, hey, I instant message you on Facebook. How come you didn't get back to me? I'm like, I don't have that push notification for I am. I don't have it for Instagram. I just have these things right here. But we get interrupted, and sometimes we get interrupted by God. And how do you feel that when you're going through your life and God interrupts us, and it does happen? And here's the thing is to really understand and really know that God interrupts us because he knows what's best for us and he knows what's best for those around us. He knows what's best for us and he knows what's best for those around us. And we think about it, God is our heavenly father. And you know, father knows best. Anybody remember? Okay, never mind. a long time ago, okay. I remember the reruns, way first my, before my time as well. But God knows what's best for us. And, and here's the thing is that he knitted us together in our mother's womb. He knows our past. He knows our present. He knows our future. He is an all-knowing God. And he'll interrupt us because he knows what's best for us and what's best for others. And so today we're going to do like a broad kind of a brushstroke of uh, the Apostle Paul. So you have your Bibles open to Acts 9. We'll be in verse 1. And we're going to talk about Paul. And in these verses, we're going to see this major interruption in Paul's life. And as you're turning there, I want to kind of share about Paul's pedigree before this interruption come. In Acts 9, he's called Saul, but it's the same name. His name changes later to Paul. But prior to this interruption, we're going to read about with Jesus. Paul said in Philippians that he was circumcised on the eighth day. He's given his pedigree through there. And that was a big deal for a Jew letting them know that, listen, I was circumcised on the eighth day. He was part of the tribe of Benjamin. And the tribe of Benjamin, that was one of like the elite tribes that they felt from for, for Israel. He said he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. In regards to the law, he was a Pharisee. And a Pharisee, we know, were the religious leaders that kind of knew everything about uh, the Old Testament. And he was known for persecuting Christians and he just, that was what he was known for. And he just talked about it. And he says, as for righteousness based on the law, Paul said he was faultless. Right? Okay. But here's the one thing is that Paul wasn't saved. And until Jesus showed his unconditional love and interrupted Paul's life. So we're in Acts 1, uh, Acts 9. We're going to open up there and just kind of share the word here. And listen to what is written here. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that he can find anyone who belonged to the way. The way is actually disciples. That's what they called it, the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? And whether they're men or women, they might be taking prisoners to Jerusalem. 
As he neared Damascus on the road, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice, a loud voice. And it said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. He replied, now get up, go to the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Major interruption in Paul's life. I mean, he is thinking that he is doing God's will. In reality, he's actually in God's way. And God had to interrupt him during this time to get him on a new direction and following God's direction. And we need to understand and really know this, that God interrupts our lives to redirect our lives. There's sometimes that we think we're doing a good direction, okay, but it's not God's direction. So God will take times to interrupt our lives to redirect and to make sure that we're following him. And Paul, on his interruption to Damascus, as he's going uh, to Damascus uh, on the road there, Jesus interrupts his life. And through that, what happens is Paul's life is completely changed. At the same time, uh, the, the Lord interrupts another man, Ananias, and tells him to go into the city and go to Straight Street and go lay hands on Paul. So what does he do? He goes in, he lays hands on Paul. Paul accepts the Lord. He gets baptized. He's full of the Holy Spirit and his life completely, completely changes. I think about in my life when God had to do that for me. I was uh, at a church service in Melbourne, um, not at Calvary Chapel, it was actually First United Methodist, and both of the pastors are actually gone in Lakeland at one of the, the uh, leadership meetings. And I'm in church with Bridget, and the kids are in youth, and, and, um, and as the, the, the man was speaking, I remember, I remember it's called First Frame Thinking, I never forget the sermon that he was given. And as he's speaking, all of a sudden, it's like he was speaking directly to me. It's almost like tunnel vision. No one else was there, and he's speaking right to me. And I've been to church, going to church, you know, listening and all this. And, and that day, God really spoke to me. And at the end, he said, he said, somebody's in here, and you have sinned against a holy God. And man, I knew that he was talking to me because I was really religious, but I didn't have a relationship with God. And as he said that, he said that because of God's kindness, he's drawn you to repentance. And my heart sank because I knew he was talking to me. It was God was speaking to me. And at that day, my life completely changed. Um, and, and I remember accepting the Lord that day. And I told Bridget, man, I need a Bible. Like go, and she's like falling off her, her uh, cause she accepted the Lord years prior, okay? And she was like, what, you know? And it's so ironic is when that happened, she called Dee Dee and she asked Dee Dee, listen, Mike needs a Bible. What, what's a good Bible to get him? As a matter of fact, here is that Bible that Dee Dee recommended, NLT uh, Life Application Bible. And man, I have torn this thing up. You know, God just gave me a hunger for his word. And as he just changed my life and redirected me and just going through and reading this and just understanding who God is and knowing him and him changing my life. And that's the thing is that that's what God does. When God gets a hold of us, he changes our life. And anybody here thankful that God has changed your life? Amen. He is so graceful. And even then when we mess up continuously, he still has that grace for us. And it's so incredibly amazing. And so Paul, as he's grown in the Lord, he gets to know the Lord more and more and more. He spent three years in, in, uh, in with Jesus, actually. And as he's spending time, he gets to know the Lord and, and the Holy Spirit in him. And, and as he's starting to know uh, the Holy Spirit more and more and more, he's understanding these interruptions come in his life. And as he's grown in the Lord... He's being led by the Holy Spirit. And Paul is literally going where the Holy Spirit is telling him to go. Don't we wish we did that every time? But as we read through scripture, that's what Paul did. And I have an example here. And listen, this is Acts 16, 6, 6 through 10. It says, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Phygeria and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Kind of weird that he's been kept by the Holy Spirit not to preach. And there's a reason for that. But he was obedient and he listened. And when they came to the border of Misha, they tried to enter uh, Bithiah. But the spirit of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit, would not allow them to pass into Misha. 
And so they went down to Tros, and during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and, and begging him to come to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had this vision, they got up, they got ready at once, and they left to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. See, that interruption and God, uh, Paul knowing that interruption, the amazing thing that happened from not preaching there, the Philippian church was birthed because of that interruption. You see, when we listen to God, the things that happen, it's good for us and it's good for those around us. They show up there, they preach the gospel, and there, the, what we read about, the church of Philippian, okay, that church was birthed. And so God interrupts us and he knows what's best for us and which direction to go. Uh, Psalm 32, eight says, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway of your life and I'll advise you and watch over you. That's a promise from God right there that he will guide us along the best pathway, which way to go in our life. And he'll advise us and to watch over us. And I'm so thankful that we have a loving God that we can hear from and be nudged and move forward. And he's gonna guide us and he's gonna take us. And so the, God, the direction that God takes us is always the right way to go. But here's the thing about interruptions is that God frequently uses them, but we spend so much time deflecting them and missing the messenger. And why does that happen? Why do we miss that at times? I truly believe because we are so inundated with how the world is. It's difficult. I mean, you watch, especially now with what's going on with the watching TV and all the things that come at us, it's so easy for us to get sidetracked off God and to focus on the things of the world that are things that are happening. I mean, this is a big year right now. We've got, you know, we've got an election year coming up. And so that's a big thing. We got COVID and all these things are focusing on that and it gets us sidetracked off of God. And the thing about it is what consumes our minds really controls our life. What we allow to consume our mind, our minds will control our life. And really what happens then is that we make sure is that when we're following God, that we make him a priority because as we kind of go off of God sometimes, our priorities change and we don't put God number, God number one in our life. And with Paul, Paul's life completely changed in his priorities. Listen to what he said in Philippians 3, 7, 9. He says, and this is amazing, think about where Paul was from and how he's writing this now of where he was at, talking about his pedigree and how much who he was. And he writes this, he says, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I mean, do you hear that? He's talking about, you know, he's saying, man, I used to, you know, he, what we read earlier about how he had this, this pedigree life and now he's losing everything, but Christ is his number one. He says, I consider everything garbage that I may be gained, uh, found in Christ, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. See, what a change in Paul's life. His priorities completely, completely changed. And here's the thing, church, is that God interrupts our lives at times to reprioritize our lives. He'll do that. And as we look at things and we focus on things that are not of God, he'll reprioritize our lives because listen, here's the thing is that we said it earlier, that God wants the best for us. But here's the thing is understanding that God wants the best for us, but he is that best no matter what. And we focus on him and he's gonna direct us and he's gonna lead us. And the thing about it is, is as I was thinking about this, or really praying about this and how God reprioritizes our, pre our lives, I was just thinking about my past life and about me and really how I used to be, because I used to be really about loving me, about loving my business that I had prior getting into ministry, loving the money I was making from business. There's nothing wrong with making money, but I had a love for money and I had a love for my business and my identity was wrapped up in my business and making money. And here's the thing is, if it's okay, I just wanna be open with you 
Is it okay to be open? I grew up in a really poor household. My parents got divorced when I was young. I was about seven years old. My mom raised us. We didn't have a lot of money. We were on food stamps. And I told myself, if I, when I got older, I was never going to happen, let this happen in my life. But what happened is, is I didn't put God in my life. I put money as my God. And the funny part about it is as I started to make, I had a successful business that did well. And as time went on and making money and making money and making money, I still had an empty hole in my heart. <laughs> And God loving me so much, he saved me, reprioritized my life totally. It was, a, it was matter of fact, it was during a time that um, I was making a decision uh, on a business decision where this group wanted to bring me on to model my business amongst their business, which was work nationwide. And they wanted to take that model and there was a struggle, but God always wins. And we're so thankful. And the thing is, I think it's so important to us to understand as a church, as we're walking this out and knowing that church, listen, is that if you have nothing, but you have Christ, you have everything. If we have nothing but Christ, we have everything. Apostle Paul, who was this Pharisee, religious man, and the things that he said, he said that his grace, no matter what, is sufficient. No matter what God ever did for me in the future, ever again, no matter what, his grace is all sufficient for us. And we know this priority put in God's first, when we do that, there are promises from God when we do that. And man, several verses I really love. Matthew 6, seek his kingdom and his righteousness first. And it says, then it'll be added. I love uh, Proverbs 3, 5, 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, which is difficult because as people want to live on understanding. But he says, acknowledge him in all the things that you do and he will make our what? Paths straight. See, often God works like that. When we prioritize putting God first, often what he does is he says, listen, put me first. Okay, focus on me. I'll take care of the other stuff. So it really comes down to our action, putting God first and not really worrying about the other stuff because God is always going to take care of it. And that's what I even see with Georgiana. You guys are so focused on God. God's just taking care of the rest. And that's what we do. So it's our action and then God's promise. And as we're following him, we have to make sure that um, we're not focused on the world, but we're focusing on him and we're loving people and loving God. The greatest commandment that God gives us, and we all know it, is to love God with what? Our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength. And then we love others as ourself. I think about it this way. It's loving God and then loving others. It's the cross. It's loving God and loving others. And the thing is, is our determination for loving others is actually determined by how much we love God. If we love God and know him this much, our love for people are gonna be, is gonna be this much. But if we love God like this, our love for people is gonna be just like this, sacrificing our lives to reach the lost, to be there, to be hope for people, to, listen, do you think that people need hope right now? And the, the hope is where? It's the church, it's Jesus Christ. And here's the thing is that God interrupts us to share his hope through us. He'll interrupt us to share his hope through us. Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 15, 13, one of my favorite verses, may the God of hope, you've been going through the names of God. Well, here's another name, the God of hope. Okay, the God of hope will fill you with all joy and peace. And here's the key, as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, that God is hope. And he will give us all joy and all peace, but we have to trust him. And then when we do that, we overflow with hope by the power of the Spirit. 
years ago, um, before I was following the Lord, I was kind of like an angry guy. And uh, I think it all came from when I was younger and my parents being divorced and all the things we didn't have. And, um, and I used to have like an internal, internal anger. And sometimes I would take it out on the boys. And what's so ironic is that when you, if you were to ask our boys now, did your dad ever like get angry? Now, don't, I'm not perfect, okay? But they'll tell you that, man, dad is pretty calm. And that's only by the grace of God. You know how God takes things away from you? And some things that he leaves you with to work on, I've got plenty of those, okay? But one of the things he helped take away from me was that anger. And I know it's from the Holy Spirit giving me joy and peace and trusting him. And when I mess up, asking forgiveness and then overflowing with that hope because people need hope. The book of Job in 8, uh, 11 and 13, it says, those who forget God have no hope. And we see right now, even in our own country, people are losing hope. And while these elections are coming up and we're all gonna vote, but here's the thing is we don't put our hope in that. We put our hope in who we put on the cross, Jesus Christ. And our, as our nation, we need to put our focus on the Lord. And what, what does God want us to do? He wants us to be hope dealers, okay? He wants us to be hope dealers, out there dealing hope to people everywhere we go. And man, people look at the church and they say, okay, listen, there's gotta be some, that's, that's hope right there. And here's the thing is, as we deal hope, you know, imagine this, imagine you're, you're, you're like, okay, I'm gonna be a hope dealer. You go to a party and you know how people sometimes stand around and they talk to each other and they'll like say, hey, so what do you do? Well, like, uh, I'm a doctor. And somebody says, well, I'm like a police officer. And they say to you, what do you do? Well, I'm a hope dealer. And I, oh, wait a minute. Okay, hang on a second. Okay. But the thing is that we need to be a hope dealer, dealing out hope in our homes, our workplaces, our community, and our church. And man, I just love so much that when I'm going through something in my life, that I'll get a text from somebody, somebody that I know. And so, you know, you ever notice that? I don't know if it's ever happened to you before, but you're going through something, you get a text that somebody sends you something that's encouraging, like a verse or something. And I love that. I'm just so thankful that God interrupted that person to text me or to call me and say, hey, I had this feeling that you're, maybe you're having a rough day. I want to pray for you. I just absolutely love that, how God does that. Listen, the Holy Spirit's alive and active, amen? Yes. He is. If we just listen, man, he'll just guide us and direct us. And the thing is that he'll direct us and guide us to somebody that really needs hope. If it's a believer or not a believer, it doesn't make a difference. And the thing about it is for us is that as we're walking this life out, we don't walk from a standpoint towards victory. Man, we walk from a standpoint that we already have victory. Man, we have the Lord and what Jesus did across 2,000 years that we can walk from that standpoint and knowing that, listen, we have eternal life because of what he did. Our lives, okay, here, and I truly believe that the early disciples, they did what they did because they knew that this was not their bodies. They knew that this was not the real them. You could do whatever you want. I know who I am. I know where my spirit and my soul is going. And man, you could do whatever you want because I know I'm going to be with my Lord, okay? I'm going to follow through and do what God asks me to do. And I just tell you what, I'm so encouraged when we read this and how our early disciples, early apostles, all the things that they did. And man, it's so amazing. So here's the thing for us, church, is that God interrupts our lives to redirect our lives, to reprioritize our lives, to interrupt our lives, to bring hope to people through us because God, he knows what's best for us and he knows what's best for those around us. So the question is, is what do we do? Like, what do we do? We want to be used by God. We want to be interrupted by God. So what do we do? The first thing is that we got to be open. We have to be spiritually open to allowing God to do that. And during the mornings, it's a good thing just to pray, God, today, just open doors for me today to share, to be, to be a hope for you. Maybe it's going to the grocery store and just being kind to somebody whatever, but God opened those doors so I can be a beacon of light, so I can share hope with people. So we gotta be open, that's the first thing. The second thing is we gotta be intentional. 
And being intentional really means that we have to have our spiritual eyes open during the day and really taking time and saying, God, my, I'm going to be intentional today. So when that door's open, we're intentional in knowing it, okay? And it brings us to the third thing is that, listen, we need to be faithful. If we're faithful and when God opens that door and we just take, and the reason why sometimes we don't, because we're, we, instead of being faithful, what do we do? We have fear, but not having that fear, but having faith and then open the door and sharing and talking and being a hope. And right now is just a really great time because so many people are confused of what's going on. And matter of fact, all across the world right now, God is doing a work through, and it's, it's a terrible situation that's going on, but God is doing a work where many people are coming to know Jesus Christ, amen? And so he's doing a work right now in so many different places. And so earlier, I talked about FOMO. So I got a new word. It's actually two words, or it could be also one word. It's FOMO OG or FOMOOG. You can hashtag that one, okay? I made that up. Uh, my wife thinks I'm a dork. Um, try living with an English teacher who has a master's degree. And, um, but FOMO OG or FOMOOG stands for let's have a fear of missing out on God. Let's have a fear of missing out on God, what God has for us. And man, God will open doors for us anytime, anywhere, any place, as long as that we're open, we're intentional, and then we're faithful. As a matter of fact, if you do that quite often, you will see that God will do that more and more and more. Bridge and I were on vacation last week. We got to go to North Georgia, and, um, and we're up in North Georgia, and while we're there, um, I was invited to teach at a church up there. And, and so we wanted to do some, uh, go do some trails. And the place that the church is meeting at is at the at a bottom of a mountain. And it's kind of like an amphitheater. And I wanted to know where it was to make sure I wasn't going to be late. So we drove there and noticed that there were some trails there. And as we get there, we walk up this trail and we're just going up the side of this mountain. And um, listen, in Florida, everything's flat. We were huffing and puffing by the time we got to the top. And we get to the top and we look over this beautiful ravine. It was absolutely beautiful. And we're just standing there and just looking at it. We decided to stop and just talk together. And there was a couple over to the left of us that brought their coffee up. They brought like a French press and their coffee cups and drinking coffee up there and just having a good time. And to the right of us, there's uh, two ladies and they're speaking a foreign language. And I'm trying to figure out what it is. And I'm like, Bridget, what is that? What are they saying there? I can't understand what they're saying. And I'm like, we've been to Ukraine a few times on mission trips. And, and so I'm like, what are they saying? I, said, I don't know. And she's like, I don't know. Maybe it's like French. And I, go, I don't know what it is. And as we got done, uh, we started to leave. And as as I started to leave and Bridget started to start to walk down, I felt God nudge me to talk to them. And I'm confused because they're speaking a foreign language. <laughs> Not speaking, I'm thinking they're just there like on vacation. I don't know what it is, but we don't lean on our understanding, okay? And I'm like, I'm on vacation myself, Lord, and, and I'm struggling to, to go back down. And there's a little bit of fear. Do I say something to them? And God's saying, do you remember what you studied this morning? And that morning, I was in the book of Luke. I've been in the book of Luke in Luke 13 where Jesus is at the synagogue and he's teaching. And there's a crippled lady for 18 years by a spirit. And Jesus goes to her and it says that he went to her. And I wrote down in the side of my Bible, I wrote down Jesus being intentional. And underneath it, I said, be intentional like Jesus and as I'm standing there struggling, I felt the Holy Spirit said, you just wrote that this morning. And you're going to walk away after you said you're going to be intentional like Jesus? So I turned around and Bridget kind of saw me and I kind of went back and talked and just said, hey, uh, I don't know if you speak English, okay? Uh, like, where are you from? And lo and behold, they spoke English. Doesn't God know everything? And just got a chance to really talk with them and share with them and um, asked them about their faith and got to share about Jesus with them. And just, and the thing is, is that I invited them to come to service. They didn't show up, but we're not responsible for what happens. We're just responsible to be a hope, be a light to people and share about Jesus. And as I wrap up here and the band's up here, 
I think about uh, in my past when Bridget and I, before we got married, um, I had a bachelor party, okay? And at my bachelor party, uh, we stopped at Fifth Avenue um, in Indian Atlantic and a bunch of my friends, and we get there. And we get out, and this guy comes and talks to me. Out of all the people, he picks me, and he says to me, you need Jesus in your life. And I'm going, okay, this guy's like a Jesus freak, okay? And he starts to talk to me, and he spoke to me with such compassion and such love that I never forgot, I didn't accept Christ, or I didn't, but I never forgot that man talking to me. I never forgot, I don't know who he is. I have no idea, I've never seen him again. I can't even remember what he looks like, but I never forgot that day. And the thing about it is, he doesn't know about me. He doesn't know where I'm at in my life. See, sometimes we don't see it. God sees it, God knows it. He just asks us to be faithful and then watch what God does from there. Church, we serve such an amazing, amazing God. He is so incredibly awesome. And so church, as the band gets ready to play, um, I just wanna tell you that all the things that Georgianne is doing here, God is really using you to make an impact on this community. As I hear about feeding faculty, feeding teachers, supplying uniforms, feeding kids, VBS. My fact, that video is awesome. It's on the website. It's really good. And just all the things that you're doing, and God is using Georgiana in such a mighty way. I know George, uh, Pastor Corky always says we're on a postage stamp. But let me tell you something. You guys are worldwide, touching ministries across the world. God is using you. And I just see that, and it's like, and that's why Bridget and I just love this church as well, and all the things that God's doing through you all. And uh, you really do make God look good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much. You're so incredibly amazing. And God, Lord, I just pray, um, God, as we just continue to move forward in all that you have for us, God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. God, as we come together, Lord, may we just really stand and worship you, God. And even those that are watching right now may have so many things on their minds that are just going on. May they just take a moment right now and just forget about it and just worship you, putting you first, God. God, I truly believe, I truly, truly believe that God that when we get home to heaven, as we're worshiping you, God, I believe the closest that we can experience that as we worship you now, because we forget about everything and we focus on you. We have that joy just to, just to focus you. I think it's the closest we're gonna understand about heaven. So God, we thank you, Lord. We worship you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
tell you what, uh, church, that worship song was not planned. They didn't know what I was going to be talking about as we end here, but I love how God does things. And here's the thing for us as known is that, listen, heaven is our home. One day we're going to be there. And imagine what that's going to be like. I'm going to read about it in a moment, but it's going to be an incredible thing. See, we're not from here, okay? We're actually for heaven. And I love in Revelation 21, and I just love these verses and how um, John has write, is writing this. And he gets this glimpse. And listen to what he writes here. Revelations 21, he says that, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place now is amongst his people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And here's the thing churches is this, 
he will wipe every tear away from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things have passed away. He who is seated on the throne has said, I am making everything new. Man, looking forward to that, right? Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all things and I will be their God and they will be my children. See church, that's our future. That's why we have hope. And that's why God wants us to be out there sharing the hope because one day that's what it's gonna be like. It's so a church, listen, we love all that Georgiana is doing here. It's doing amazing things through Christ. And I truly believe, I truly, truly believe this, is that the best is yet to come for this body right here. So church, we love you. Thank you for allowing me to come up here and to teach the word and um, have a blessed day. God bless. Thank you.